if you want to spend your money on a storage device, which one do you buy? This 500GB hard disk drive or this 120GB SSD? In this video I will tell you what is the difference between these two storage devices, pros and cons of solid state drive in comparison to hard disk drive, and the most important, we will try to understand how SSD works. Let's start with disassembling SSD. Inside we see only one board with microchips on it, that's all, and you already can see difference with HDD. Disassembling HDD took me much more time, and its structure a little bit more complicated, I discussed it in the previous videos. And the most attentive you will see that the box is definitely bigger than the board inside. The reason they put such a small printed circuit board into such a case is just to follow the standards, so you can put it inside your table PC slot. For laptops, M.2 solid drive is usually used. It's much smaller and looks like a bar. And that is the first benefit of a SSD, especially for an ultrabooks. SSD is much smaller and lighter, so in total your laptop will be lighter and smaller. Another thing that is quite obvious, SSD doesn't have moving parts. No motors, no actuators, no spinning disks, it makes it quiet. If you are a HDD owner, you know how it can sound like when it spins at 7000 rotations per minute. So that's definitely good side of SSD. This also brings another point. Cause you don't have a moving parts and data isn't read and written by a small electromagnets connected to an actuator, solid state drives are much more resistant to a physical shock. HDD of course has protection against shock events that I described in previous video, but in case of SSD you don't need such a protection. You don't have mechanical moving parts. You don't need sensors to detect disk g-force all time. Don't need to stop read-write process when your laptop works in stress conditions. Correspondingly, SSD can work in environments where HDD cannot, where everything is shaking, moving and experiencing regular stresses. Another main benefit of a SSD disk that everybody knows about is a data exchange speed. That's actually a reason why most people buy them. To launch operating system or your favorite game in a blink of an eye. For example, here is a comparison of HDD, SSD and M.2 SSD. Regular SSD, which I showed you already, is 5 times faster than HDD. And if it comes to a M.2, that is also called next generation form factor SSD memory, it's 25 times faster, because it utilizes newer interfaces, which allow to increase speed significantly. And that is already a big difference. According to tests, you can achieve speed of 2.5 GB per second for reading and 1.5 GB for writing. Comparing these numbers with HDD is like comparing Bugatti and Flintstone car. So, insane speed is definitely a huge plus. And to understand how this speed is achievable at all, we need to look at the SSD working principle. So let's come back to our printed circuit board and look what we have there. To power all these microchips, there are obviously different power circuits. Here, here and some here. And except power circuit, there are only two other types of chips. The memory controller and the memory itself. Controller is like a bridge between memory and computer. It processes commands and data that computer sends to it via SATA interface and then ask memory chip to do what is needed – read, write or refresh memory. So controller works with both computer and memory, and memory communicates only with a controller. This exact board has a 120GB storage capacity, and if you think of 120GB as of 120 billion bytes, you are wrong. In reality, it's around 128 billion 850 million bytes, because you probably know that 1 kilobyte is 1024 bytes, not 1000 exactly. That means each chip has a storage capacity around 43 gigabytes, and it would have more memory, but I assume somebody stole one chip. Now to understand what are those chips, we can google marking that is written on the chip, but we find nothing, cause that information kinda secret, so we cannot look at this chip exact characteristics. But what we can do, we can find that this board has a 3D NAND TLC type of memory, so at least we can understand how it works without exact numbers and data transmission protocols. And good for us, cause they are boring as hell. So let's start from understanding what is non-volatile flash memory. Main feature that it can hold data even when power is off. It's used in SSD, SD cards, USB drives, USB drives, USB drives. So in reality, SSD disk is just a huge pen drive. But pen drives usually work via USB interface, and SSD usually utilizes other interfaces, simplest of which is SATA. But still, it doesn't answer the question how the data is stored, so let's dig in. 
The possibility of creation and non-volatile electrically erasable memory became possible thanks to the MOS transistor invention, and specifically the one with the floating gate. Here is how a conventional MOS transistor looks like. You have a gate, drain and source terminals. By applying control signal or voltage to its gate, current can flow through two other electrodes. Basically, with a signal at gate, you give a green light for current to flow through other electrodes. But what is important? Signal applied to a gate must be high enough to be able to open the pass for current. In other case, transistor remains closed. Now we add another layer to the gate, sandwiched between the gate and the transistor base. We have two gates now. One we call control gate, another is floating gate. Floating gate separated from base and control gate by an insulation at both sides. And that's how floating gate MOSFET is made. So what we can do now to store the data in it? We can push charges to this floating gate using tunneling or hot carrier injection. So for normal people you just push and extract charge into it and from it using two external transistors. And because this floating gate is isolated from anything, it doesn't lose that charge over time. And that's how you write and store data in MOSFET transistor, in a form of a charge in a floating gate. Now to read this data you need to apply specific voltage level to a control gate and look whether transistor opens or not. What do I mean? The fact is that charge in a floating gate not only sits there, it affects voltage threshold needed to open transistor. It increases the voltage level we need to apply to open transistor due to the charge screening effect. Uh, let's have an example. We have no charge sandwiched. And we apply 1 volt to control gate. And transistor opens. We read a logical one at the output. But when we have charge in the floating gate, 1 volt is already not enough to open transistor. We apply 1 volt and it remains closed. We read a logical zero in such case. I used 1 volt just as an example. In reality, voltage levels are different. And what you can do now? You can connect lots of transistors together. Then connect them into a pages, blocks and finally microchips. And then you put them into a SSD case and sell for $40. But what isn't clear yet? The name of the memory used in this SSD is 3D NAND TLC. So why it's called 3D and what is a TLC? Here is a structure of different types of NAND memory that is widespread at the market. Each layer of a cake presents one cell or one floating gate transistor. The simplest one is SLC, which stands for single layer cell. When you take two layers of single cell memory and put one over the other, what do you get? You get a cheaper and smaller memory chip, which is good, especially for laptops. So that's why it's called 3D. Second is a MLC. What is obvious is that the cake has more layers, it's 4 already. And each cell stores 2 bits, so using one transistor they somehow store 2 bits, not one. To understand how, let's come back to transistor's pictures for a second. So if you have any guesses how to store 2 bits in one transistor, pause the video and write the command. So what engineers do? They control the amount of charge stored in the floating gate. And then, by applying voltage to control gate, they measure current that flows through the transistor. And what we have? When transistor is fully closed, we have zero current. And we read 0, 0. When it's open a little bit, it's 0, 1, which stands for a low current. More, 1, 0, higher current. And when it's fully opened and we have the maximum current, it's 1, 1. And logic like that can be implemented to extend bit per cell value even more. And that's what memory manufacturers did. Created MLC with 2 bits per cell, TLC with 3 bits per cell, and QLC with 4 bits per cell. But what is that? Number of bits increases, but PE number decreases. What is PE? Program slash array cycles. Yeah, it's always like that. You get a cheaper, more dense memory, but you lose endurance. And the more bits per cell you have, the less cycles you have. That is a drawback of a SSD. And if you compare it with a HDD, which theoretically doesn't have limited read-write cycles, 1000 cycles sounds like crap. It's not even comparable. But 100,000 sounds eh, okay, I think. It can serve you up to 5 years. What is another problem that is hiding behind short SSD lifespan? You cannot easily recover your data if something went wrong. In case of any problem, it takes a lot of time to figure out what is wrong and to fix it. Usually nobody bother and just store unnecessary stuff on a SSD that can be easily downloaded or recovered. For example, operating systems or games that can be downloaded again. And other more important info stores on a HDD. Because HDD is a solid disk with an info on it. You can disassemble it, take out the disk, put it into another hard drive and read your data almost without the problems. In case of SSD, situation is harder. If you cannot fix the problem using software, you might need to desolder the memory chip, put it on another board, 
But what if chip memory block inside is fine, but chip internal controller that transfer data is dead, or other internal circuits aren't working? Yeah, it would be impossible to fix it. Yeah, so that's a pain in the ass. That's definitely a huge minus of a SSD. And final table looks like that. And what I can say about it, it's definitely worth buying SSD to install operating systems and applications you use often, or games because of its incredible speed. It has a pretty comparable price to a HDD. And to store some important data that you don't want to lose, it's better to have a copy somewhere in the cloud or at the HDD storage, for example. Also, it's cheaper to have a HDD just to store all unnecessary trash there. So consider subscribing for the channel and don't forget to press like. I would really appreciate it.